Zoom folks, thanks for hanging in. I'm running just a scooch behind today, so I appreciate you hanging out while I get everything set up. Okay, okay. All right, so um, admittedly, there is some repetition in this class. So some of the stuff we're gonna cover now is gonna like sound a little familiar, um, but I don't think that's a bad thing, right? We know people learn better uh, when they hear something more than once. Makes sense, just knowing our memories, right? Um, and it's really important to just ponder how does science work? How do these things break down? And um, think about, in particular, how do we do science and psychology? And so I think a lot of times this is what we think psychological research looks like, right? Like we tend to think it's people staring at rats or pigeons in boxes, right? And having them do things and rewarding them. And certainly that is a part of psychological science. Uh, but in fact, research in psychology can look, oops, a whole bunch of different ways here. Gosh, hello, back please. You know, it can be people with rats, but it can be observing and playing with kiddos. It can be uh, doing therapy. A lot of the clinical science is seeing what type of therapy works and for whom. It can be having people fill out surveys, either paper and pencil or on a computer. It can be watching people through a one-way mirror. And in fact, we have one of those right over here in the SSL. So uh, if you walk over here, the other day it was one of <laughs> so there's a small interview room, and then right next door we have an observation room, um, where you can sit and observe what's happening. Our students have used it for research in the past, um, but uh, the people who use it most often are our social work students when they are learning to do interviews and things like that. The rest of the class sits in the observation room and then gives them critiques. So not only can you see them through the wall, but our observation room also has cameras. Um, so it can be recorded so the person can watch it back and get feedback later. And then um, I had to use the footage of Stephen Yu. I don't know if you guys know. Chung Chi, uh, he's in Barbie movie. In his early career, he did a lot of stock photos. Um, him pointing at a computer screen because unfortunately, if you don't like staring at a computer screen, that's a lot of what you do in psychological research, whether you're setting up these online surveys through an online survey program, or whether you're in this case, running some data using a data program. We tend to use SPSS. A lot of psychologists now are using a program called R, uh, and it's not like talk like a pirate day. I know that's coming. <laughs> it's just the letter R. Uh, and with that, you do a lot of your own coding. So psychological research can be as diverse as there are psychologists, to be perfectly honest. Um, when I was at APA this year, there were people presenting about dog cognition. And so they do their work with dogs and dog trainers. Um, they were teaching dogs to be creative, which was really cool. So, so the dog had to do something that wasn't in its repertoire and it said create. And they showed video clips and one of the dogs threw its toy at the trainer. Like, okay, that's creative, right? Not something you typically do. So 
research is very multifaceted and really like it can go anywhere your imagination can take it. There are classic psychological studies where they just observe people in nature or they ask them questions um, before they did something. There's a famous study where they asked people questions like after they walked over a bridge and people who had like done something exciting were more likely to be open. Um, even our students here have done really creative things. So I had a student once, actually I had two different students do this, who took our research room around the corner, turned it into a fitting room and had people try on different sized jeans and got their reaction to what's it like when the jeans don't fit? What's it like when the jeans feel great? Um, I think I've been mentioned before, I had a student who uh, was a stingrays uh, with stingray cognition. Um, and actually, they just did uh, a little article about her on the DWU website. And they've done like callbacks, psych student, and she now works at the Georgia Aquarium with the pinnipeds, which, if you don't know, are seals and sea lions. So, there's lots of different ways research can look, research can feel, and that you can involve people in research. And so we've talked about this sort of in passing, but I thought it'd be a good idea to actually break this down. Like, what is the scientific method? So you start by asking a question. All science comes from curiosity. What is happening and why? How can we explain it? So then you're going to do background research, going to look for sources like we did with Stephen Leist on Monday, right? Find out what's already been done about that question. What have other scholars found? And then we're going to construct a hypothesis. So based off that existing research, here's a new question I have, and here's the way I think it would go. <clears throat> then we're going to test it somehow, either with an experiment or with some sort of questionnaire, data, observation, and things along those lines. So then we're going to say, is our procedure working? If yes, we proceed. If no, we might have to troubleshoot. Uh, I had a survey once that had an error. I tried to fix it while it was still open. And it put my participants in like a loop pages over and over. Right? So now, anytime I send out a survey, I piloted on like five people first. <laughs> it's the, is it working? Right? does and do what it's supposed to do. Uh, if your procedure works, you're getting good data, then you analyze that data again using one of those statistical programs, whether it's SPSS or R, or there are more advanced programs if you want to ask more advanced questions. So for example, when I do structural equation modeling, the program I use actually allows me to draw out the model I want to test and then test it for me. If your results align with your hypothesis, or if your results align partially or not at all with your hypothesis, you should communicate the results. However, as we've already talked about in here, that doesn't always slide. Right? So there are certainly cases where people um, with all the files are a problem. They didn't find a result, so I'm not going to tell anybody about it. I'm just going to kind of chuck this data. But in fact, it's just as important to talk about when there's not significant results. So, for example, a um, couple of the giants in the field of psychology of gender, uh, including Ellis Eagley, they've looked at and done meta analyses with studies about gender differences. And they sort of built their career on showing there aren't actually gender differences in a lot of cases, right? That's just as important to report. They feel like it's just as important to report when there's not racial differences. So your experimental data can become background research for a new or future project. You could be asking a new question, forming a new hypothesis, coming up with the same or different methodology for your experiment. And so science is a continual process. You're kind of never really like done. And there are times where you feel like you're done. I mean, I want to fully acknowledge that 
Uh, I think I have worn my shirt already that says sometimes scientists are made of makes me sad, right? Um, I did a sabbatical a few years back, which is where you did a semester you just work on your research. I was trying to collect data from college age time. Really hard to get that from site classes, right? Hard to get a lot of guys. And so I was recruiting all over the campus because like I'm only doing research. I'm recruiting everywhere in math classes and rec and leisure classes. And by the end of the semester, doing this the whole time, I had 13 people. I remember sitting in Dr. Casey's office right across the hall and telling her, I don't think I want to do research anymore. Okay. As soon as I get promoted to full professor, I'm done. And then, weirdly, uh, when the pandemic happened, it stimulated more conversations among researchers. We started meeting via Zoom a lot more. Um, and so I built up research groups, and it's a lot more fun to do research when you have other colleagues to play for much. And so I have a publication that came out of that work uh, with a colleague at my alma mater, Canyon College, and with a colleague who just got her PhD and she's going to be at University of Arkansas now. Um, well, actually, she is not at Swiss, she's part of you know, I have a project I'm working on with my grad advisor, who's in North Carolina, and a colleague of mine who's in Ohio, right? And so sometimes just getting those connections going gets you reinvigorated. The other thing that really helps for me is that, uh, for those of you who don't know, we have a class called Site 380 Supervised Research in Psychology. And what that is, is that you can get credit for helping one of us, usually Dr. Ariel or I, but sometimes Dr. Jackson does it too, with our research. And I've been using that class as I design the study and then I just bring people on. And that's a lot of like cognitive load on me. And that's a little stale. And so what I've been doing the past few semesters with that class is the students design the study. And I just sort of help them guide them and help them find the resources they need. Some really cool studies. I was actually just um, putting together a poster from one of those studies we did last fall, by uh, yesterday. And we found that just manipulating your selfies before you post them, whether you're putting them through filters or whether you're Photoshopping them or using Facetune, uh, makes you much more vulnerable to body image disturbance, to internalizing ideals, to a whole host of things that aren't great, right? Um, and so this can get hard, to we'll put it that way. And depending on the type of research you do, it can be limiting. Um, so for example, I'm able to do most of my research from home because I do this survey-based research. I can work on it there. I'm much more efficient when I'm at home. Um, because when I'm here, I like to have my door open and then like people stop by and chat with me and, you know, uh, but like I was chatting with Dr. Kittredge from chemistry and he's like, oh, I can't do that. My lab is here. All my stuff is here, right? This also means that during the pandemic, a lot of people's research just had to stop, right? Because they were literally locked out of their labs because they were locked out of campus, right? And so there's like this take up in research because of that. And it's going to really proportionally affect junior scholars. So faculty who are pretty new, uh, graduate students, right? And also particularly people who had to provide child care, right? So in the majority of cases, that's women, but not always, right? Um, that is going to feed into that as well. All right, so one of the things we've talked about in passing again is open science. The idea that we should be sharing science as widely as we can, right? And so I have a little video here about that. As a researcher, you're spending hours, months, or even years locked away in search of the meaning of life. Who knows what you're really doing? Are you getting the credit you deserve? And is the world getting enough out of you? Let's talk about this. Let's open up. 
Open Science is making your research results available for anyone interested. It's not only about making your publications available and reusable via open access, but also making your research data open by following the FAIR principles – findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Open Science as well refers to being transparent about your process and methods. The goal of Open Science is to allow others to use and reuse your results. This can be done before, during or after the research process. This way you can, from the very beginning, make your research visible and valuable for others. Researchers, the professional community, companies and society can benefit from it. By giving others the opportunity to respond to your results and using their feedback, you also have the chance to create a more authoritative work. What is there to open in open science? Open access, open data, open metrics and impact, open source, open repositories, open lab journals and notebooks, to name but a few. Interested? Here are four words starting with R to think about when engaging in open science. Reliable. It is important to evaluate the research in two ways. First, with respect to scientific principles and criteria, like validity. Second, with respect to criteria out of the professional context. This will help ensure that your results are more reliable. Reproducible. Transparency is critical when doing research. Open science allows you to clearly show what you've done to get the results you have. By being open about your methods, processes and decision-making during your research, someone else doing the research again should get the same results. Reusable. This is the same R we mentioned when we talked about FAIR. By making your research results reusable, you allow others to build upon the solid foundation your research has already created in a given subject. Relevant. Research quality describes the measurable influence of academic research on the academic community. Research impact includes environmental, cultural and societal impact, economic returns and societal benefits. So follow the four R's of open science. Let your research be reliable, reproducible, reusable and relevant. But I bet you're thinking, there's no way I can do this alone. Relax, there's help. You can contact the library, the often available institutional research support team, a corporate copyright information point, or a research data management office. I do have to say, if any of you are interested in sort of open science in general, our librarians do know quite a bit about it, and so they'd be willing to help. There are also national initiatives that can support you, or the team, with the tricky questions. The NIE HBO, the LCRDM, and SURF are all there to help. These are all Dutch initiatives, but other countries have equivalent organizations that are willing to help you. Let's recap. Follow the FAIR principles, be transparent, stay with the four R's, engage others, and ask for help when you need it. That way, we can all benefit from the research you are doing. Behind closed doors, in your lab coat, with your goggles on. So, sounds great. Why isn't Open. everybody doing it? <laughs> There's some pros and cons here. Oh my gosh, I literally just put this video in this morning. Um, glad that it's not working. A uh, couple links here. Um, you heard the advantages. More people can read it. That might get not only new ideas from the research out there, but help stimulate other new ideas. Um, leads to more citations, more impact. Uh, businesses have brought it, uh, access to it and that helps them. But there are some disadvantages. Um, it takes some time before new journals, traditional or open access, get an impact factor, get well recognized within the community. And so we're not like this here, but at other places, when you go up for tenure or promotion, they actually look at how well read is the journal you're publishing in, things like that. Um, you know, it varies through the discipline. Some have very few of these and some don't have, you know, have a lot. Um, there is admin additional administration. Um, and uh, there's these author processing charges, which if I can get the video, uh, we'll be able to look at. And um, 
there are these predatory journals, which we're going to talk about soon, um, that are basically like pay to publish. And uh, it can be extra work, right? And uh, it's unclear what can all be published. Sometimes especially the predatory journals, your publication can be published without peer review. But if it is a good quality journal, it's going to follow everything that we talked about with Stephen on Monday. And it is going to be peer reviewed and it is going to be looked at very carefully. So give me just a sec. I'm going to try and find um, this video that I found this morning that, you know, the link's not working. All right. Hey, there we go. Ocean breeze, lush lilac, forest flirt. If there's one thing we know, good smells for candles, not vaginas. Hey, Christopher. Yeah, boss, what's up? What do you think about making some of our articles open access? That's a good idea. Make the articles free to the public so that anybody can appreciate the latest scientific advancements. I like it. Of course, the author would have to pay some kind of publishing fee. Yeah, okay, that's reasonable. What, like a couple hundred bucks? Yeah, I was thinking maybe $11,000. What? Yeah, $11,000, and we put your article on our website for anybody to read. Why so much? Oh, you know, all the, the costs. What costs? Uh, reviewing the article? Yeah, we don't pay reviewers. We guilt them into it because it's good for science. Accurate. Okay, um, what about <laughs> formatting? Your 12-year-old niece does that for us. <laughs> well, we got to publish it. That costs money. It's a PDF on a website. Kaylee does it in like two seconds. Kaylee? Your niece. Oh, yeah. Besides, who's going to be able to afford this? Oh, people will pay. Why? Because they have to. What do you mean? Researchers have to publish in order to keep their jobs or get promoted, and we're one of the most prestigious journals around. People will pay. So it's extortion. <laughs> Here at Nature, we're doing crime. Oh, Christopher, don't be so dramatic. So let me get this straight. You want to charge researchers $11,000 to publish an open access article, thereby ensuring that only researchers with the most money get to publish an article, which defeats the purpose of having open access articles in the first place. Yeah, that's right. And this is guaranteed to be profitable because researchers' livelihoods are dependent on a predatory system that values publishing in high-impact journals. Hey, you got it. This, of course, is insane. It's academics, baby. And so again, obviously that's comedic, but it's not that far off. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab that link and just copy paste it because apparently I can't embed things anymore. Like It looks like it's going to play down there. Anyway, I love feeling like I don't understand technology. That was sarcasm. There we go. Copy this. There we go. And there's another one looking at these pros and cons. They're going to be pretty comparable. Um, but again, we there is some uh, concern about quality. There is some concern about, again, it being really expensive for researchers. Like you need to have a pretty substantial grant to be able to spend $11,000 to get something published, right? Like the whole budget for the psychology department at Virginia Wesleyan, I think is like 2,500 for the year. So to imagine that I would have $11,000 just laying around, right, is sort of laughable. Journal publishing, as you probably got from that, is big business. Um, so these are various journals. I think um, Stephen mentioned Elsevier um, and Wiley the other day. Uh, $9.8 billion annually. And they're charging researchers to publish open access. It's problematic, right? Um, 
Springer Nature, the, the, we just watched a parody video about 1.2 billion. Uh, and people will pay it because nature is considered like the journal in science. If you get published in nature, that like makes your career. Uh, Rutledge, Taylor, and Francis are about 734 million. Sage, 500 million. The ABA publishes their own journals, and that's about 100 million a year. Um, and then PLOS, which is fully open access, I think it's plus one is how I've usually seen it represented, in and of itself is 31.5 million. Um, and so this is a, a blog post talking about that. Again, not the best quality, but like no one's really publishing journal articles about this because what journal is going to publish about how problematic their business model is, right? Um, and so again, like the importance of journal prestige for career advancement. Um, they uh, they charge the library to access their journals. They charge the authors, and as they said in there, the peer reviewers who do these reviews, they don't get compensated. So when I do reviews, I'm doing it to help science, right? Um, I even guest edited a journal issue and I did not get paid for all the work I did on that, right? Uh, it's kind of a racket, let's be honest. Like academia is kind of a racket in some ways. Um, and so predatory journals, which I mentioned, are different than these established open access journals. They try to look like established open access journals, uh, but they're different. And in fact, I just saw this morning, so I'm going to pull it up <laughs> in my email. I had an email from a predatory journal. Uh, they will academic spam you. So I have to find it. Hang on just a sec. And this will also show you why I don't always answer your emails so quickly because I forever have a billion. Uh, the Journal of Virtual Learning and Medical Sciences. They read an article about feminism as a protective thing. And somehow that thought I should submit something about virtual learning in the medical sciences. I have written about virtual learning. That article is not vir about virtual learning, right? And so the idea is they send these, they try to make it sound like it's such an honor for you to get them. There are also predatory conferences who like a month before a conference in China will be like, we want you to be a keynote speaker. Just pay us $5,000 to attend, right? And, and most academics are smart enough. They don't get sucked in by that, right? Uh, but some do. And so I have a couple videos about predatory it's journals. It's so these are some actual researchers who uh, are going to walk through how they submitted a really bad manuscript and got it published. Come along to see what happened. You said you just wanted money. You said this was just business. Is this business? Is this how you do business? <laughs> it's very dramatic. In March 1665, a seemingly small thing happened. The first scientific journal was published. A printed version of the papers and letters read at the Royal Society meetings were published and that was born of the first scientific journal, Philosophical Transactions. The first decades of its publication saw many memorable papers, including Isaac Newton's first publication. The success of the Philosophical Transactions inspired the birth of many other journals all for one purpose, contributing to the knowledge and imparting it to one another. Nowadays, almost all advances in science find their way onto the pages of a scientific journal. Today, there are thousands of peer-reviewed journals publishing millions of articles a year. Gradually, journal publication flourished into the premier mechanism for evaluating researchers' performance so that their job targets, income, bonus, and promotion are tied to their publications. Meanwhile, publishing in high-impact journals has become more competitive. All these have motivated some researchers and postgraduate students to pay to have their work published for the sake of career progression or graduation. Such an environment has contributed to the growth of predatory journals. 
predatory journals accept and publish almost any paper just for money without properly reviewing them and in many cases faking the peer review process. In this video, we intend to prove predatory journals literally accept any for the sake of money. To do so, we prepared a nonsense manuscript in less than half an hour by putting together random sentences from random papers. Who can be the best corresponding author for the paper which seeks to challenge the predatory journals mafia? Zulema, a rebellious character of a Spanish TV series, Wisa Wis, or Lost Dogs. Mi nombre es Zulema Gair. We created an email address for Zulema and submitted our manuscript to a predatory journal using her name. And for your information, the selected journal was a Scopus Index journal. What's the topic about? The topic of which? Okay, we need something fancy. Something on online learning. Virtual reality. Sustainability. We want to use all the trendy words. Yeah, in the, the effectiveness of immersive virtual reality. The effectiveness of immersive virtual, virtual reality, reality in sustainable online learning. Does it make any sense? Not sure. <laughs> Said was in charge of methods and results while I was preparing introduction and discussion. First, we searched a topic in Google Scholar to select some papers randomly. Then, we copied some haphazard paragraphs from each paper to put them together and make our manuscript. From 1 to 10, tell me a number. 2. Yeah, so I go to the second page. And now again from 1 to 10, one number. 3. 3, okay, I open this first. Okay, another number. And 4. I think we have already enough for the introduction, introduction section, so it's almost done. We have done our literature review for the introduction section. Said also inserted some irrelevant fancy graphs in the results section. Even we didn't stop there and we replaced some of the citations with funny names such as Said's pet names, Hollywood actors and actresses and even Donald Trump. My pet's name? Johnson? Here. Mm -hmm. With? Super name. Okay. Oh, let's add the name of two good friends. Number one is Donald Trump. So add Trump. Trump 2019. And Kim Jong Un. And who is your favorite actor or actress? Seta Jones. Okay, add Seta Jones. Zeta Jones, now you have a paper. <laughs> Very recent, 2021, on e-learning. You can add it in your CV now. The whole manuscript was ready in less than 30 minutes. To make sure that we won't be caught with any plagiarism software, we used a free online paraphrasing website to reword all sentences. No need to mention how ridiculous the sentences turn out to be. Finally, we submitted it and the game started. Said, I have a news for you. Jesus, it's a disaster, buddy. Zulema's paper is accepted. Seriously? <laughs> My God, very nice. Zulema's paper has been accepted for publication. The journal has asked for 400 US dollar publication fees, but of course we will end the game here. You can find the submitted manuscript and the acceptance letter through the link posted in the description of this video. When we started this initiative, we were not so confident if we can get the acceptance for such a rubbish. Although we all have heard about predatory journals, it's so difficult to believe that they literally publish every book. Don't destroy your CV with such publication. If you have any similar experience, please share with us in the comments. So again, just pure 
nonsense plagiarism and this predatory journal would have published it, right? Um, and that is, you know, obviously problematic. Um, this next one is sort of how to's to avoid this happening. Open access journals provide many benefits for both authors and readers. However, some of these journals are questionable, operating only to make money without any scholarship. Predatory journals without a rigorous peer review process can take control of authors' work, misinform readers, and undermine public trust in peer review. There are several warning signs that you should look for when investigating the legitimacy of a journal. Good journals may also exhibit some of these signs, so use all of the information available to you and your best judgment to form an overall impression of the journal. Most open access journals are supported by authors in the form of a clearly stated publication fee, paid only when the article is accepted for publication. A predatory journal might require a submission or handling fee, and I do have to say, like, good open access journals will work with you. So um, in my work with uh, the Center for Engaged Learning, uh, or what do we actually call it? Center for Educational Technology and Something-Something uh, Research. I should really know the CERTI over at Chesapeake Bay Academy. Um, we just submitted to a open access publication. Uh, one of our co-authors knows... The people, some people on the board reached out and said, look, we're not going to be able to afford the publication fee. And they gave us a, a voucher. They waived the whole fee. Um, and so acknowledging that, like, we don't have money just laying around, right? Which is paid whether or not the manuscript is accepted. A legitimate open access journal should also allow authors to retain the copyright to their article and release it under a Creative Commons license. A credible editorial board will support the validity of the journal. Research the board members to get a sense of their expertise and publication history. If you cannot find much information about the board, it is reasonable to have reservations. And do not submit your paper if the journal is missing an editorial board or an editor-in-chief. Dishonest publishers often expand their selection of journals to draw in more authors. In some cases, if a publisher is touting hundreds of new journals, it may not be supported by qualified <clears throat> editors. Again, look into the qualifications and publication history of the editors to confirm the credibility of the publisher. And just to show you all how easy that is, I'll show you one of the journals I work with quite a bit. I'm on their editorial board. Called body image it's the leading journal in research about body image shockingly right <laughs> okay so they're again published by elisiver so they're making lots of money off of everything we're doing for them but if you go to about on any journal they're gonna have an editorial board um and then you can see who are the editors the associated editors and like i know this like intuitively, because I know these people. Uh, but let's say I wanted to be like, okay, this editor in chief, what has she done, right? I can just go over to Google Scholar, if I can type it properly. And I can search her. And I can see her profile and see that she has a lot of publications. These are just the first 20, right? <laughs> In the field of body image, right? And so I could confidently say, this person knows what she's doing, right? Uh, she's developed one of the most used scales in our um, field, things like that. Uh, you know, if I wanna look up, again, I know this person not only because She's on the board, she's known in the field, but uh, she taught me when I was in college. But if I want to look up Sarah, you know, I can see she doesn't have a profile, but I can still go through and see all the publications she has. And some of them are very well cited, right? Um, and so that's really important to know. Like this one's been cited by almost 3000 people. Like that's amazing, right? And so it is fairly easy to do that. Um, 
but you have to take the time to do it, right? A good journal will receive enough content to publish an issue when scheduled. However, some dishonest publishers will project a deadline for publication and then fail to follow through. And this is really important um, because good, especially well-established popular journals will have pretty low acceptance rates. Like they might only accept 20% of the papers that are submitted to them just because they don't have room, right? So if a journal's having a hard time getting enough papers to have an issue, that should sort of raise some red flags. If you find that an issue was scheduled for a date that already passed and the issue is unavailable, you should be wary of submitting to that journal. Journals should make revenue with scholarly advertisements, such as for societies and manuscript service companies. Inappropriate advertisement is an indication that the journal is not tied to scholarship. Likewise, poor language and typos on the website could be a bad sign. Yeah, don't submit. <laughs> Sometimes a journal claims to be national or international to make it seem more established than it really is. Make sure the editorial board reflects the geography of the journal title. For example, if the word American is used in the journal title, the editorial board location should be based in America. Fundamental errors throughout published articles may indicate that the reviewers and editors were not truly familiar with the topic. Look for misspellings of scientific terminology and keep an eye out for repeated errors when browsing the journal. And this can happen in the best journals. One of my favorite examples I've ever seen is, that got published, made it through reviewers, made it through the copy editor, is someone had in their paragraphs where their citations are, should we cite the crappy, you know, Smith article here? <laughs> and that got published, like, in black and white, back when journals were actually, like, paper. Um, and so it's sort of, like, that can happen to the best of it, but it was one thing in that whole article, right? If there's a lot of stuff going on, it's problematic. Journals in a specific discipline should provide the appropriate expertise to review the journal content. If the journal articles do not match the journal title and scope, chances are there is little to no editorial management. If you have concerns about an open access journal, investigate the journal with these eight points in mind. Identifying a predatory journal before submitting your paper can help avoid a lot of confusion and frustration. To find more information about publishing your paper, visit... And again, uh, places like our library or even like a public library can be a really good place to get information about this. Um, I don't even know if people realize this, but our librarians all have master's degree in, in library science. They have, you know, a professional... Um, body of work they keep up, they publish, they're part of organizations. Um, and so they know, they know more than me. Like, honestly, even though I'm like an APA style expert at this point in time, they know way more than me. So we got about two minutes left in class and we can keep talking about this on Friday. What are your reactions to the idea of open science? and its accessibility, both to people who can read it and people who might be trying to publish it. If you were a researcher, would you be trying to publish open access or what barriers would be in your way? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you got to be really careful. But yeah, I agree. It is important. Right. Professor Myers. Yeah, 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 Elijah. Um, I'm not on campus right now, and I know the test is due today, so I was wondering, should I just send it to you, or I'll be on campus later? Just stick it under my door. <laughs> That'll okay, be good. Cool. Um, yeah, kind of going along with what we were just talking about, uh, what Roman was saying, there are places now, and this is sort of interesting, where people will publish what they call preprints. 
like before they submit it to a journal. Um, and this is also part of open access. It's part of accountability. People will also uh, pre-register their studies. Um, and it, basically you commit to these plans uh, and it shows that like, I'm gonna follow through, I'm not gonna do a bunch of ad hoc weird little studies, right? Um, and so a lot of people are starting to do that as part of the process. And yet at that point, those haven't been peer reviewed, right? And yet they're out on the web, they're open access, you all could come across them when you're searching for stuff, right? And so it's like, it's a little confusing. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Thank you all for being patient with my lateness this morning. I will be on time on Friday, I promise. Um, and like I said, I will try to have your exams graded by Monday.